Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back. Uh, it's definitely getting cold in New York, hence the uh, the sweater. Uh, but winter is definitely coming. So, <laughs> but uh, welcome back to 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 Med Geeks. We'll discuss another case today. Unfortunately, I'll be doing this solo. Uh, Rachel is not here this week. She's a little busy, but uh, it's all good. We'll we'll run through a great case today. You know, this is gonna be for my orthopedic surgery job. Um, it, it's a pretty cool case. It's it's rare. Uh, which is uh, which is why I thought you know it'd be it'd be good to discuss. So let's get started. This is a 28 year old male, uh, no past medical history. He came to the emergency department uh, for right knee pain for one day. He said you know he was he was playing tackle football with his friends and ended up uh, uh, being tackled from behind and fell onto his right knee. Initially, he had no pain. Uh, nothing like that, but two hours after the injury, he started developing some right knee pain and swelling. Uh, he, you know, he tried to ice it for for a day or so, but it wasn't getting better. So he came into the emergency department to seek medical care for the right knee pain and the swelling. That's why I was consulted. Um, I went down to see the patient, and you know, he told me this story. Uh, and he said, you know, he's not having any numbness or tingling, but he was having uh, increased swelling despite icing for for one day. So, which is why he was concerned and uh, seeked medical attention. He's endorsing some right knee pain and swelling upon examination. Uh, and so, you know, I started to examine him. Um, his vitals were stable. Everything was good in that sense. In terms of the MSK exam, the first thing you want to do is neurovasculature check, like we mentioned before. So um, his extensor halicus longus, his tibialis anterior, his gastroc soleus muscles were all intact. He was the sensation was intact to light touch from L4 to S1 distribution, and his dorsalis pedis pulse was palpable. So in terms of neurovasculature, uh, he was all good. So next, I visually examine him. So, you know, it's pretty evident that the right knee was more swollen than the left knee. However, I didn't see any erythema. I didn't see any ecchymosis. There was no bony deformity. So I went to check his range of motion. The normal range of motion for the knee is approximately zero to 140 degrees. Some may say it's negative 10 to 140 degrees. Um, for this guy on, on his right side, his range of motion was about 0 to 110. On the other side, the contralateral knee, it was 0 to 130, 140, which is full range of motion. He was having tenderness of palpation, but it was very diffuse and no pinpoint tenderness whatsoever. I think his tenderness was coming more from the swelling than anything else, actually. When I asked him, you know, why isn't he able to flex his knee properly? Is it because of his pain or is it because of the swelling? And he says, you know, it's it's because of the swelling that it's not allowing to flex all the way. He has, he has pain, but it's about 4 to 5 out of 10. Not terrible. The next thing I wanted to see is if he was able to straight leg raise. You know, straight leg raise is an important test to do with any knee pathology. It kind of dictates whether the patient has... Uh, the extensor mechanism intact or not. So his patellar tendon, his, his quadriceps tendon, are they intact? So this patient was able to do his straight leg raise properly with no pain, which is a good sign. So this means his patellar tendon is intact, his quadriceps tendon is intact. And he also tells me that he's able to bear weight and ambulate. He actually walked to the hospital himself uh, which is very reassuring in terms of his, his physical exam. Next thing I do is obviously get an x-ray. With any ortho uh, case, you want to get an x-ray. This patient has plain film, so you know I ordered x-rays of the right knee, which is AP, lateral, and sunrise views. They come back and I see a lucency in the superolateral aspect of the patella. And I see it on the AP view. I see it on the sunrise view. But I'm confused at this point because, you know, he does not have any pinpoint tenderness. 
he has he's able to straight leg raise he's neurovascularly intact he's able to bear weight and he's able to ambulate so this kind of isn't making sense to me in terms of a fracture because he, his pain would be much worse he has swelling for sure but it's the the picture is not completely adding up so what i did was i got the image for the contralateral side and the same thing so left knee ap lateral and sunrise views and funny enough the x-rays come back and i see this exact same lucency pattern on the left side as i do on the right side so there's a superlateral lucency through the patella and that kind of uh makes the diagnosis itself so um if you don't know this yet, this patient had a bipartite patella instead of a patellar fracture. And this is actually quite a common uh, misunderstanding when you get these x-rays back because it's, it's quite a mystery because this patient didn't have any trauma to the left knee. He didn't have any swelling or pain to the left knee, but he still had that lucency. So with that, I think it's important that we talk about the bipartite patella. Um, it's often very confused with the patellar fracture, which is why I think it's important to talk about it because the management differs in both patients. So a bipartite patella actually is congenital. It is a failure of the patella to fuse completely. That's why you have the lucency going through the patella. It occurs in up to two to three percent of patients and of those two to three percent, approximately 2% are symptomatic. So 98% of bipartite patella are actually asymptomatic. The way they become symptomatic most commonly is due to trauma. So like this patient, when he fell onto his right knee, he started having pain and swelling, uh, making this bipartite patella um, actually symptomatic. In terms of the location, this is very important also because uh, well, first, 50% you know, of bipartite patella are bilateral. So it's important to get contralateral x-rays to see you know, if it actually exists on the other side. And in terms of location for the, the lucency itself, um, there are three types. So type 1 will be inferior. This is approximately 5% of the patients. Type 2 is the lateral margin of the patella. This is approximately 20% of the patients. And then type 3, which is the most common and which is what our patient had, is the superolateral. That's approximately 75% of the patients. And so, you know, this case will be based on differentiating bipartite patella to a patellar fracture. And so, the most common ways to differentiate them are number one, Bipartite, patellar, bipartite patellas will be superolateral. As opposed to patellar fracture, they can be anywhere. They can also be comminuted. So, you know, if there's only two-part patellar fracture or two-part patella, then you want to consider getting the contralateral aspect of the knee uh, to make sure it's not a bipartite patella. The other thing is uh, the lucency itself. So if it's rough-edged, it's more likely to be a fracture. If it's smooth edged, it's more likely to be a bipartite patella. And then thirdly, and we already talked about this, is always getting the contralateral side of the knee because you wanna make sure if it's, if it's on the other side, it's, it's likely to be a bipartite patella. In terms of treatment, you know, uh, because most of these patients will be asymptomatic, you won't even see it uh, unless it's incidentally noticed. For the patients, 2% of patients who are symptomatic, uh, the treatment will be non-operative. So rest, ice, immobilization, and physical therapy. If these patients do not improve within six months, then they may be indicated for operative treatment. But otherwise, most of these patients do improve um, you know, with, with uh, non-operative treatment. So again, we'll summarize differentiating between bipartite patella and patellar fracture. Bipartite patella is approximately in 2% of patients. Uh, of those, 2% will be symptomatic. This will be because of failure of fusion of the patella, so these will be congenital. And, and for those who are symptomatic, 
which will be about 2% of patients, you want to go for a non-operative course first, which will be rest, ice, immobilization, physical therapy for six months. And if these patients fail uh, after six months, they can be indicated for operative treatment, as opposed to a patella fracture, which will be rough edged and usually followed by trauma. For this patient, you know, the swelling, you might be wondering, it's likely that the swelling is because of soft tissue swelling after the trauma itself. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very confusing because it, it could definitely be assumed that this patient had a patella fracture had we not gotten uh, the contralateral aspect of the knee. That's it, guys. Uh, that's the uh, bipartite patella. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to shoot us a question uh, in the comment section. If you like this, obviously like it and uh, subscribe so you can follow us every single week. All right, guys, we'll catch you next week. Um, have a great week. Bye.